e filia e shesë flu. FIDH, Human Rights in China and the International Campaign for Tibet support the moment of silence. We appreciate the numerous recommendations on civil society and human rights defenders. China has accepted and stated it is implementing Ireland's recommendation to facilitate a safe and enabling environment for defenders. There's a point of order from China. Mr. President, I would like to ask you to clarify which organization is speaking currently. Thank you. Hello, organization. The organization taking the floor now is the International Federation for Human Rights Leagues. Mr. President, it's the FIDH. Yes, sir. It's FIDH and its member organization, namely Human Rights in China and International Campaign for Tibet. China. Mr. President. As regards the NGO taking part in the UN activities, we have very clear-cut regulations. I think there is no need for me to waste any minute of your time here. However, the speaker who was taking the floor mentioned names of these organizations. I would like to know whether they are organizations with consultative status with the United Nations whether their organizations are on the list of speakers. Mr. President and the Secretary, would you please give me some clarifications on these questions, please? Thank you. I thank China. The Secretariat informs me that According to our procedures, FIDH does have a status with ECOSOC and FIDH is speaking and it is thus, uh, as far as I can tell, authorized to speak. I can see two points of order, China and United States. China. If, Mr. President, if I didn't hear it wrongly, I heard more than one organization's name mentioned just now when he was speaking. In addition to that organization whose name you mentioned, the other two organizations do not, do not have consultative status with the ECOSOC and they are not on the list of our speakers either. This is a very evident violation of the rules of procedure of the Council. It's an incident of this nature. I request you, Mr. President, to abolish the uh, status of being a speaker on the list if there is a violator there. Thank you. I thank China. The United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we highlight that the United States firmly believes that accredited NGOs must be permitted to speak in this council. FIDH is an accredited uh, organization. We do not understand the point of order by China and we do not support it. We support that the NGO be allowed to continue speaking as it is an accredited NGO. Thank you. Thank you. I can see another round of statements. I can see Pakistan, Canada and Cuba. And I'll leave it with those three. Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we fully understand the point of order raised by China. Uh, my country has, in fact, been raising this issue as well in, in the past that 
if there is a speaker from among the NGOs, then they must be recognized within the forum of, of the council. Now, if FIGH is a recognized and accredited NGO, it should speak on its own behalf. But if it speaks on the behalf of certain others who are not accredited, then I do not think that they are in a position to do so. We don't, uh, we don't argue with the right of the FIDH to speak, but they, cannot, they can speak only on their own behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Canada. Thank you, sir. With all due respect, it's quite clear in this case that the NGO taking the floor is duly accredited to speak, to take the floor. And if other parties wish to be associated with a statement which a duly accredited uh, speaker wishes to make, whether or not we agree with the contents of the statement, quite clearly the NGO is accredited uh, and should be allowed to continue. So we urge you, sir, to allow that uh, statement uh, from the accredited NGO to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Canada. Cuba. Thank you, President. We are not trying to question the right to speak by an NGO which enjoys consultative status at ECOSOC. However, the request being made by the delegation of China, one that we request fully, is that uh, be made clear on about which other NGOs they are making this statement on behalf of. Because if they are speaking on behalf of other organizations which do not enjoy consultative status in ECOSOC, then they do not have the right to make a statement in this way on behalf of such NGOs. So we reiterate the request for clarification as to the position of these other NGOs as made by China. And we would ask the Secretariat to confirm or not whether the other NGOs that have been mentioned by the NGO that has the floor have consultative status or not. And if they do not, then we fully support the motion made in light of that by the delegation of China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I see two members insisting on taking the floor. Do you insist, or may I now call on the Secretariat for explanations? You do insist. So first of all, France before Germany. Thank you. France attaches a great deal of importance to hearing the voice of civil society. FIDH is duly accredited and it may therefore address council and we support the possibility for FIDH to speak in this forum. Thank you, France. Germany. My first point, Mr. President, I would like again to reiterate our interpretation and position that on the principled question whether an NGO can interpret its general comment in the manner as ISDHA has done it has not been decided on principle yet. We have only refused to refer the matter to the Bureau. The principle needs to be discussed further. Second, I think it is not in accordance with the customary rules, the rules of gentlemen agreement here in the Council to be, to be dragged into a protracted procedural debate on issues which are not well prepared and on which we have no legal opinion of the Secretariat. So uh, I'm quite amazed to hear a position that even NGOs who are mentioned in speeches of other NGOs need to be accredited to uh, the ECOSOC. I believe this is clearly raping the procedural rules. And in this context, I would like to ask you to refer the matter to first to the Secretariat or to the Bureau to prepare it properly to be decided for the Council and to continue with the UPR debate. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. That is what I intend to do now. I will give the Secretariat some time to give clarifications, but we are pressed for time, of course. Thank you. FIDH is duly accredited with ECOSOC. The fact of mentioning other entities is a practice established over a long, a long time. It is also quite clear, however, that the report of this session will only make reference to FIDH. 
Thank you. I thank the Secretariat. With that explanation, may we give the floor back to FIDH to continue its statement. We are running very late. The United Kingdom, do you insist on taking the floor? Well, I was going to say my mic won't work, so I guess the decision was made for me, but unfortunately, Mr. President, it has worked. Um, I just want to add our voice to those of Germany. Uh, this is an important issue, but it is also important that we get back to discussing human rights and not procedure, but we support the right of accredited NGOs to speak and participate in this council. And just as any other person who has the right to speak in this council, they have the right to determine what their content is and what they say. That's what freedom of expression means. And freedom of expression is a principle in the Universal Declaration that every single member state present here today has signed up to. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I give the floor back to FEDH. Thank you. Concerns over suppression of fundamental freedoms and the ongoing crackdown on citizen activists. At least 11 rights defenders have been tried recently, including Dr. Shu Jie Yong, who was convicted and imprisoned in January. To demonstrate its respect for its own constitution and commitment to uphold the highest human rights standards as a member of this council, China should end prosecution against these defenders and urgently free all persons arbitrarily detained, including Liu Xiaobo and his wife Liu Xia, Kuo Fishong, Wu Ga Scholar, Ilam Toti, and Tibetan Abbot Ken Po Karse. We mourn the death of human rights defender Cao Shunli, whose death while in detention must be thoroughly investigated and those found to be responsible for any actions that contributed to her death to be held accountable. China has accepted the recommendation to protect the rights of ethnic groups. Much more needs to be done to realize this commitment, including urgent reforms of repressive laws and measures in ethnic areas, including Tibet and Xinjiang, to guarantee equal enjoyment of all human rights and to address root causes of disparate forms of protest, such as self-immolations. To ensure effective monitoring of the implementation of these recommendations, we urge China to take all necessary steps to respect and fulfill its citizens' fundament fundamental rights and freedoms, including freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, association and religion, as well as their right to supervise and participate in public affairs. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Human Rights Watch has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Human Rights Watch supports the moment of silence. If, as China claims in its out outcome report, no one suffers reprisals for taking part in lawful activities or international mechanisms, why did human rights activist Xiao Sun Li die? Why was she detained? Mr. President, one week after her death, her family still don't know where her body is. If, as China claims in its outcome report, the Chinese government guarantees that all ethnic minorities fulfill exer fully exercise political and other basic rights, and that citizens have the right to criticize and make suggestions to any state organ or official, perhaps it can explain today the basis for its allegations of separatism against Uyghur economist Ilam Toti, who criticized Chinese government policies in Xinjiang, but explicitly rejected independence for that region. And if, as China claims in its outcome report, people in China have the right to peacefully speak their minds and gather together, and that there is no so-called issue of suppressing human rights defenders, perhaps it can explain the basis of imprisonment of lawyer Xu Xinjiang in January 2014 and other members of the New Citizens Movement over the course of 2013 and 2014. Mr. President, China's response challenges not only the integrity of the UPR process and China's participation therein, but also demonstrates that China does not uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights required of a member state, nor does it for fully cooperate with the Council. In 2014, exactly 25 years after the Tiananmen massacre, Human Rights Watch and thousands and millions of human rights defenders inside China had hoped for better. Thank you.
Je vous remercie. Thank you. Right, lawyers Rights Watch Canada now has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Lawyers Rights Watch Canada supports the moment of silence. We also request Council to consider our remarks on China's UPR. Council should be gravely concerned about the case of democracy activist Cao Shen Li, who peacefully campaigned for civil society input into China's UPR process. In September 2013, she was scheduled to fly to Geneva to attend civil society meetings in preparation for China's October 22nd UPR. She was arrested at Beijing Airport and disappeared until October 21st when she was charged with picking quarrels and provoking troubles. She was seriously ill in prison but was refused medical treatment. On February 20th, Cao Xin Li was transferred to a Beijing hospital. She subsequently died on March 14th while on life support. In the fall of 2013, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting delivered a 1.5 million signature petition to the High Commissioner for Human Rights seeking an end to and an investigation of China's slaughter of prisoners of conscience for organ procurement. In December, the European Parliament condemned and demanded an immediate end to China's state-sanctioned organ harvesting from ex executed prisoners of conscience, mainly Falun Gong practitioners. China prohibits lawyers from defending such practitioners and courts from accepting lawsuits on their behalf. Lawyers advocating for Falun Gong practitioners, including Gao Zhisheng, are in intimidated, disbarred, imprisoned, and or tortured. Mr. President, the outcome report provides no meaningful response to documentation of China's attacks on human rights lawyers. In the face of systemic torture, killing for organ procurement, deprivation of independent legal representation and harassment of human rights defenders and lawyers, Lawyers Rights Watch Canada considers states' comments welcoming China's human rights progress as cruelly inappropriate. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Action Canada for Population and Development, you have the floor. President, ACPD welcomes the actions that the government has taken to recognize the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people in China. In its report to the working group, China openly shared that Hong Kong will continue making efforts to strengthen the protection of the rights of people based on different sexual orientations. In addition, in its response to recommendations from the government, governments of the Netherlands and Ireland on establishing anti-discrimination laws or instruments in schools and in the workplace to protect the human rights of LGBTI people or people with a different sexual orientation or gender identity from any form of discrimination, the Chinese government recognized through its response to recommendations 186.89 and 186.90 that LGBTI people are equal before the law and should be protected under existing laws, such as China's law on regional national autonomy, the law on the protection of rights and interests of women, the law on the protection of rights and interests of the elderly, the law on the protection of minors, the law on the protection of rights and interests of disabled persons, and the law on the promotion of employment. However, we want to encourage the government to take further action to fulfill its responsibility to protect LGBTI people in China. The current law that forbids discrimination are only based on the grounds of ethnicity, religion, gender, age, disability, and other aspects. Yet without legal interpretation of the term other aspects, LGBTI individuals are prevented from seeking court redress to protect their rights when they encounter discrimination in schools, at the workplace or in other circumstances. Therefore, we recommend that the Chinese government either clarifies the term other aspects or specifically includes reference to sexual orientation and gender identity in the above mentioned laws so as to ensure that all people, including all women, the elderly, children, people with a disability and workers can enjoy equal rights without discrimination, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Thank you. Thank you. Amnesty International has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Amnesty International welcomes China's stated commitment to ensure that all citizens can engage freely in the UPR process, and we urge China to foster an environment in which such participation can take place without fear of reprisals or physical harm. We deeply deplore the death of Chinese activist Chao Xun Li, who paid the ultimate price for campaigning for greater transparency and civil society participation in the UPR process. 
On 14 March 2014, she died in a hospital in Beijing after being denied proper medical treatment for months while in detention. Her death demands that China gives full and immediate effect to the recommendations. We regret that China has gone to such lengths to block efforts to observe a moment of silence in her memory. Mr. President, the trials of members of New Citizens Movement have shown numerous procedural flaws. Legitimate and peaceful public participation has been criminalized under charges such as, quote, disturbing the public order, end quote. We urge China to reconsider its rejection of the recommendations to remove <coughs> obstacles to freedom of information on the Internet and to guarantee freedom of expression, assembly and association. The abolition of the re-education through labor system is indeed a welcome step. However, we question the government's claim that, quote, there are no arbitrary or extrajudicial detentions in China, end quote. Rather, evidence points to the continued use of arbitrary detention, including in legal education centers and in house detention. Mr. President, Amnesty International is concerned that no state raised the issue of forced eviction in the review. Forced eviction of people from their homes and farmland has become a routine occurrence in China and represents a gross violation of human rights. Finally, Mr. President, ethnic minorities in China, including Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, <coughs> continue to experience severe discrimination. We therefore regret China's re rejection of recommendations to respect the rights of ethnic minorities. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I will give the floor to the delegation of China for its closing comments. But I must note that on the basis of information provided, out of the 252 recommendations made to it, the Chinese delegation accepted 204 and took note of the remainder. I will now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Wu Hailong for his concluding comments. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chinese delegation has listened carefully to the statements by all sides. Many countries and organizations made positive assessment of the new achievements of China in the human rights field. They commended China's openness, confidence, and sincerity in the UPR process. They recognized China's efforts to implement any recommendations it has accepted and China's support to the Council during the consideration and adopting of the Working Group's report. I would like to express our thanks to them on behalf of the Chinese delegation. Just now, some countries and organizations raised additional comments and recommendations. I would like to repeat here that China is ready to accept any recommendation which is based on goodwill in keeping with China's national realities, operable and conducive to China's human rights development. With regard to the uh, questions raised by some delegations, uh, we already made clarifications and stated our positions in the uh, dialogue in October and in our replies to the UN uh, last February. Therefore, I will not repeat them here, but I would like to stress the following three points. Firstly, the state should respect and protect human rights. This is a principle enshrined in China's constitution, which means China acknowledges the universality of human rights, and which means that our human rights protection mechanism serves every Chinese. The Chinese government protects not only the human rights of Han Chinese, but also of Chinese people of Tibetan, Uyghur, Mongolian, and other ethnic minorities. We protect the economic, social, cultural rights and the right to development of our citizens, as well as their civil and political rights. At the same time, all citizens and organizations should abide by law and operate within the framework of law. Anyone who violates the law and violates other people's rights and interests must be held accountable. In this respect, the Chinese government treats everyone as equals, and we don't practice selectivity or double standards. Secondly, the path of human rights development independently chosen by China deserves respect. Different places have different customs and traditions. The path which a country chooses for its human rights development should be decided in light of this country's history, culture, as well as its economic and social development levels. And it should be the choice of its own people. Relevant international human rights instruments also point out that the implementation of human rights principles must take into account national and geographical features and historical, cultural, and religious backgrounds. 
China will continue to give priority to our citizens' rights to survival and development while developing other categories of human rights, taking into account our own history, culture, and national realities. On some specific, specific issues, we must approach them uh, in light of the actual situation on the ground. Thirdly, China opposes the politicization of human rights issues and the practice of double standards. Some countries adopt a selective approach in assessing human rights situations. They completely ignore the human rights situations of those countries who are submissive to them. But at the same time, they used human rights as an excuse for attacking and pressuring those countries who refuse to take orders from them. This kind of practice cannot win the support of people. The NGOs can play positive roles in the promotion and protection of human rights. However, some NGOs completely ignore reality and facts, and they willfully carry out attacks and slander against some countries. We are, comp we are firmly opposed to their actions. Some other NGOs, they openly violate the rules procedure of the uh, Council, and they violate the order of our meeting, and these practices cannot be accepted. Most of our members through the voting just now um, manifested our position against this kind of act. Mr. President, the UPR is an important UN mechanism for member states to review human rights issues on an equal footing and through cooperation and dialogue. The Chinese government regards it as an important opportunity to fill our human rights commitments and listen to the views of different parties. China will continue to be committed to the operation of the UPR mechanism in an effective way, further implement the recommendations we have accepted, and promote and protect human rights through concrete efforts. And when we participate in the next review, uh, we think we will achieve greater progress in our human rights cause. In conclusion, on behalf of the Chinese government, I would once again thank all of you for your active participation. Our thanks also go to the President, to the uh, Rapporteur, and to the Secretariat for their hard work. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank His Excellency for his presentation and for China's participation in the UPR process. I now propose that the Council adopt the decision on the outcome document of the Universal Periodic Review for China as it is displayed on the screen. I see no objection to that decision and the decision is thus adopted. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this afternoon's meeting. We will meet again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. to proceed to the adoption of the outcome documents for Monaco, Congo and Malta. The speaking time for speakers registered on the list for Monaco and Malta will be three minutes.